The pocked man at your window, the pocked man at your door, the pocked man brings the plague days to stretch you on the floor. When blue flames at your candles suck, you know a witch has got your luck. Don't suffer a snake upon your hearthstone, or plague will whittle your children to bone. Your bread not to rise, your milk to stand sour, your butter not to churn, your arrow shafts to twist as they dry, your own knife to turn and cut you, your roosters to crow by moonlight. By these may a householder know himself cursed. Welcome to another episode of Is Fitz Happy? I'm Luke. And I'm Emma. This week we're discussing chapter 27, Conspiracy. Dun dun dun. I wanted to read out the whole poem because I thought it was, uh, it set the tone at least for what's coming up (laughs) in the next chapter, I think, or the next couple chapters. Yeah, some mischief. Yeah, especially the uh, blue flames at your candles because we know Chade makes all the candles turn blue. Mm Mm-hmm. And also in this chapter, a pocked man is seen as a rumor. That's true. (laughs) We jump into the chapter with Fitz talking to Queen Ketrickin about the plan that he has, and she is discussing the logistics of announcing that she fears she might have a miscarriage from the fall to draw Regal and Wallace away from the king. Fitz has gone first to Patience and Lacey, because he knows that he would not have gotten past all of Queen Ketrickin's attendants without um, someone who is a known attendant of her with him. And they are all in on doing this plan, whatever the queen says, basically. They will will follow through. They want to help the king as well. Ketrickin wants to go along with it just to help King Shrewd. That's the only reason that she really goes along with it. And she's saying, I'm not going to let Wallace touch me or anything like that. I'm going to say I fear that this might be happening, but that's as far as I'll go. Yeah. And she makes super sure to emphasize that she's not eating anything he gives her either. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. This ruse only goes so far. This is my line in the sand. Yeah. And this is where Fitz says... It will work because I know Wallace will come and then Prince Regal won't be able to help himself to come and check out what's actually going on. And so when they leave the king, the king's bedside, Fitz is going to distract or take care of the guards at King Shrewd's door. Yes, they being Regal and Wallace. Correct, yes. And so hopefully... The plan is, with Fitz whispering this at his hearth and talking about it with Ketrickin, hoping that Shade will be able to do something to help King Shrewd on the inside while Fitz takes, takes care of the guards and leaves the king alone for a while. Ketrickin, of course, is extremely upset at the treatment that King Shrewd has gone through. She says it amounts to torture, to abandon an old man like that to his pain. You do not trust your queen enough to tell me who your assistant is? It is not my secret to share, but my king's, I told her gently. Soon, I believe, it will have to be revealed to you. Until then. And she dismisses him. And that's true, I think they're introduced within the next couple days, honestly. (laughs) Yeah. Well, she's going to learn tomorrow, because Fitz has to prepare the plans. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Let her know. Yeah, so it's uh, it's definitely soon. She gets her wish soon. And this whole conversation, Fitz is kind of remarking on how it's kind of sad that Ketrickin so readily accepts that, of course, Regal did this. Yeah. And tried to murder his unborn nephew or niece. Yep. And she just talks about it so coldly, like she's planning military plans And she's willing to do whatever she needs to do to help the king. Well, almost anything. But, you know, 
she's still willing to help even in this extreme of a circumstance. Mm -hmm. And Fitz also is nervous that she's not putting her trust in him in a good way because he's not even sure if this is going to work. And it's just a lot of anxiety on Fitz's end of, oh no, the poor queen thinks everyone's out to get her, which they are, but also she trusts me to fix it and I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And also he he's kind of scared that if he stays much longer while she is getting angry at the situation, she might give away the whole plan mm -hmm. because she now knew her fall had not been any clumsiness of her own. So he had to explain to her that, yeah, somebody made the stairs slippery to make you lose your child. So otherwise she was just thinking that it was her own clumsiness that she fell. Mm -hmm. so, I'd be kind of angry too. Yeah, it's, really frustrating but from here Fitz goes to patience's room leaves the door open a crack and waits he is listening for the commotion of people getting wallace to come to the queen's aid yeah yeah he's just waiting to hear you know commotion the strides of wallace passed and then he waits a long time before he thinks maybe it didn't work and then regal hurries up and catches wallace Talking about the good wine, the good wine that somebody's almost dropping, which is gross. Yep. And then he waits a little bit longer and then approaches the door to King Shrewd's room. As he knocks, somebody calls through the door and uh, the guard asks him, like, who it is, what's happening. And basically... The guard says, Prince Regal said specifically that you were not to be admitted. Specifically you. Yes. <laughs> Fitz Chivalry. And Fitz kind of makes up a little a little thing here. Like, oh, then, you know, I really need to tell him about the... Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. He's mumbling on the other side so the guard can hear him. <laughs> He's making himself interesting enough that the guard will maybe open the door. And he does a crack. Mm -hmm. He wants to know what Fitz was mumbling. So... Fitz says, well, I can't just let everybody in the keep hear it. And the guy puts his ear to the door. And Fitz leans in to whisper and blows the powder that he has stored in his hand onto the guard's face. Mm -hmm. Night mist. Quick, effective. It was also often deadly. I could not find it in myself to care. Which, come on, Fitz, we just talked about this. This is setting a trap for Regal to be even more convinced conspiracy is really happening. And I guess desperate times. But didn't we have this whole thing about, <laughs> hey, you were too suspicious and now Regal doesn't trust that he has everything his own way. Yeah. I don't know. Desperate times, definitely. And as he's trying to reach in to undo the chains of the door, he... Learns that his plan succeeded to let Chade know, and he hears, Get out of here. Leave the door alone. Just go away. Don't unlatch it, you fool. At a brief glimpse of a pocked visage, and then the door was shut firmly in my face. And he takes Chade's advice and goes and is visible to people while all of this is happening. He goes down to the kitchen and talks to Cook Sarah, saying, Oh, what's that commotion up there? Has the queen lost her baby? And then the cook... Of course, taking that gossip immediately banishes Fitz mm -hmm. and goes to find folk who would uh, know more about it to set that rumor going. And then also he makes his way to the uh, the kitchens in the garden mess hall where he is just a presence. Nobody talks to him because there's, there's still that separation, that barrier. Fitz is not in favor yeah. in any way. And so... No one talks to him, but at least people have seen him there. He can't be a part of what is happening upstairs if he's not there. Right. He hears a couple rumors and is disgusted by some of the talk that if the king does die or the uh, the loss of the child, what that would mean for Regal's chances for the throne. Fitz remarks that it was as if they were betting on a horse race. Pretty disgusting, but also they're so far removed from everything. Right. They're not real people to them, probably. Yeah, just reading those couple sentences there, it's not a direct correlation, but it just kind of reminded me of 
you know, celebrity gossip and news of like who's dating mm. who and that sort of thing. Yeah. It's just something to talk about. It's not close to you in any way. Yeah, that's fair. And it, I'm sure it's like the same thing with these people. Yeah. Where it's just sure they've seen them in real life and know them in some capacity, but it's not like a way you would know even a coworker. It's yeah. The just, kingdom will go on no matter who is yeah. <laughs> the lead role in this film or something, you know? <laughs> Basically, yeah. The other gossip that he heard was that a boy had seen the pocked man by the castle well in the courtyard. It was supposed to have been nearly midnight when the lad saw him. Not one had the sense to wonder what the boy was doing out there, or what light his eyes had used to see this vision of ill omen. Instead, they were vowing to stay well away from the water, for surely this omen meant the well had gone bad. At the rate at which they were drinking beer, I decided they had little to worry about. <laughs> which is Chade kind of setting the scene. Yes. He has been setting these little, these little hints around, and he's been very excited when we've heard talks with him and Fitz about, you know, giving a spectacle. <laughs> right. Although he hasn't started yet and he doesn't directly say yes or no to whether or not this was him. You think Jade would claim it if it was to Fitz? He would keep his secrets. Sure. But I don't know. I just made me like, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it's probably Jade, but he hasn't done anything else besides this yet i am almost 100 percent sure this is chade because of the way that he reacts later and the sentence that fitz says not one had the sense to wonder what the boy had been doing out there at nearly midnight looking at the well with no light to see but he sees the pox man clearly <laughs> this is obviously a rumor that was uh -huh. spread around yeah i guess fair enough fair enough so he waits for a while until he hears that Regal is going to go and chop down the doors to the king's room because he can't get in. And then he heads out to the stables. Where he sees Molly coming down the stairs. Yep. And is instantly kind of rude, which he realizes and demands, why did you go to see Beric? She, I, I had feared she had gone seeking help. So he's scared for her. But it comes off as super mean and like, why are you here? Yeah. What are you doing here? <laughs> why are you near another man? But also, it comes from a place of like, maybe she's in trouble and mm -hmm. went to the person who told her <laughs> to come to me when you were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. He is my friend, she said succinctly. She started to push past me. Without thinking, I stood firm. That little line I just want to quick read out because... They have gotten close, although Beric kind of probably doesn't really talk to her and she doesn't talk to him. Right. It's somebody else who is not her, you know, her master's patience and Lacey to be around. Right. And Beric is a nice guy. Yeah. And he's super polite. And I bet he's even better than normal because this is Fitz's woman. So he's mm -hmm. got to be on his best behavior. And also... I'm sure he, uh, she's heard stories from patients before about, because she knows their history. Yeah. So through the reading between the lines, I'm sure of patients' descriptions of Beric, she can <laughs> determine that he's a good guy. So she goes up there and gives him candles that he doesn't need and, you know, just is around another presence to escape the castle. Right. They have a discussion here where everything ends and... It's pretty heartbreaking, but seeing it from a rereader's perspective, it's completely clear what she's talking about. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so Fitz is begs her to speak to him. He st stood in her way, and when she asks him to move, he says, "Please, just let me talk to you. I miss you so much. If I cannot be with you, it's not because I do not wish to." And he clearly wants to speak with her and this softens molly a little but she says we're not going to go anywhere we can talk right here so fitz relents and doesn't leave but talks to her and asks why she's so mad at him to which she responds 
Why do you think that what I feel about you is the centermost pillar of my life? She retorted. Why do you think I have no other concerns but you? I gaped at her. Perhaps because it is how I feel about you, I said gravely. It is not. She was exasperated. And I think this really points out the way Fitz thinks he loves her. Yeah. And she's come to realize the truth. Right. Which is crazy because Fitz can't even admit the truth to himself most of the time, I'm sure. It's kind of apparent, and I'm sure after self-reflection, you can kind of see how that happens. Right, yeah. But it is such a good point that Fitz always assumes that when she's upset or something is wrong, that it's about him yeah. and their relationship. And she's just pointing out that maybe I'm just upset about something else. Like, you're not the only person in my life. My life does not revolve around you. And also, we know she's pregnant, and this is the first hint in this whole conversation indicating that Mm -hmm. she knows as well. And, like, I can't just revolve my life around you. Yeah. There are other things that have to be important to me. Exactly. And while Fitz is saying, like, you are the most important part of my life, why, like, whatever, and... Molly denies it, saying no. King and waiting Verity is more important. King Shrewd's more important. Queen Ketchik and an unborn child are more important. She took them off on her fingers as if she were numbering my faults. I know my duty, I said quietly. And Fitz says, "For so for this time, since Verity isn't here, I must put Ketchik and the king and everyone ahead of my own life. Ahead of everything I hold dear. Not because I love them more, but... I floundered uselessly after words. I am a king's man, I said helplessly. I am my own woman. Molly made it the loneliest statement in the world. I will take care of myself. And I feel like... We'll we'll get into more of what I'm talking about a little bit later, but I feel like that statement, for this time I must put them ahead of my own life, is exactly what molly is talking about in this yeah and she uses his words against him a little bit later on but fitz could grasp the situation if he was told true but also that's how he's been acting the whole time so it's it's <sighs> looking back on it rereading this scene multiple times since if you know the uh the future outcomes of everything and why she's doing this, it really, really shows, you know, the poetic (laughs) parallels between these situations, but also, like, the bittersweet nature of, yeah, they kind of have to say goodbye, because Fitz, I don't know what Fitz would do if he would abandon the king right now, or go with Molly. I know, that's what I was thinking, too. I don't know that him knowing would have necessarily been any better i think he would have tried to push to have them go with ketrickin and shrewd when they left that's a good thought probably i don't know that he would stop what he's doing to save the king he wouldn't mostly because it's a very serious matter and the king shouldn't you know suffer just because he has a kid now so i think he would still try to find a way to like lump her in with the duty he has for the king and i don't think she would go with that i think it still would have been a leaving (laughs) yeah definitely and so eventually she says no fitz there was a finality in her voice pain she pushed away from me stepped past me on the staircase when she was two steps away and all of winter seemed to be blowing between us she spoke I have something to tell you, she said, almost gently. There is another in my life now, one who is for me what your king is for you, one who comes before my own life, who comes ahead of all else I hold dear. By your own words, you cannot fault me. She looked back up at me. I do not know what I looked like, only that she looked aside as if she could not bear it. For the sake of that one, I am going away, she told me, to a safer place than this. 
Molly, please, he cannot love you as I do, I begged. She did not look at me. Nor can your king love you as I used to. But it is not a matter of what he feels for me, she said slowly. It is what I feel for him. He must be first in my life. He needs that for me. Understand this. It is not that I no longer care for you. It is that I cannot put that feeling ahead of what is best for him. Goodbye, new boy. So, reading it back, clearly she is talking about the love a mother has for a child. Yes. This isn't the way you talk about somebody that you don't even really love, at which she clearly loves the child, I'm saying. She's making it seem as though, well, I don't love this person as much as, you know, you love me, but, or they don't, I don't know. They don't love me yeah, as much the, as you do, but... They just don't equate to the same kind of thing, but... Right. And Fitz is taking that as, oh, she's with some guy that she doesn't even truly feel real love with, and she actually just means, like, well, it doesn't matter if my child hates me, like, <laughs> I will love it no matter what, and that's what it needs and deserves. I also noticed the uh, hesitation, nor can your king love you as I... dot 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 used to mm -hmm. obviously she's lying to Fitz here and maybe to herself a little bit yeah i'm saying like i i used to love him now i have to move on and this was mm -hmm. kind of the final conversation right or maybe it'll this will make it easier i don't love him anymore i did but now i don't <laughs> yeah we, we can see in the the later parts of this conversation because Fitz chases after her her looking for reasons to make it less painful mm-hmm So Fitz charges after Molly, after she says goodbye, new boy, and pretty much just grabs her, turns around, and wants to make that change, her attitude change, no matter what. Yeah. He says, what can I give you? What can I tell you to make you understand what you are to me? I can't just let you go. No more can you make me stay, she pointed out in a low voice. I felt something go out of her. Some anger, some spirit, some will. I have no word for it. Please, she said, and the word hurt me because she begged. Just let me go. Don't make it hard. Don't make me cry. I let go of her arm, but she did not leave. A long time ago, she said carefully, I told you that you were like Birik. In some ways you are, in others you are not. I decide for us now, as he once decided for patience and himself. There is no future for us. Someone already fills your heart. And the gap between our stations is too great for any love to bridge. I know that you love me, but your love is... different from mine. I wanted us to share all our lives. You wish to keep me in a box, separate from your life. I cannot be someone you come to when you have nothing more important to do. I don't even know what it is yet you do when you are not with me. You have never even shared that much with me. So Molly brings up the very good point that love isn't being put in a box. That that's not how she loves. And if that is how Fitz loves, that's fine. But that is not something she wants to live with. Yeah, exactly. And Fitz basically tells her... You wouldn't like it if I told you. And she, of course, is mad at that because don't don't tell me what I wouldn't like. You don't even offer it there. Don't make that decision for me. You have no right to do that. If you cannot even tell me that, how can I believe that you love me? So I think it's a really interesting point Molly makes here that Fitz can't be deciding for her what her reactions will be without giving her a chance to even think on it she deserves that much that's not how you treat someone you love right people you love you want to give all of yourself to and i think that's a super valid point and i totally agree with her but i would also like to point out that she isn't telling fits about herself being pregnant yeah and she isn't giving him a full reason as to why she's leaving 
So it's a little bit of a two way street here because she's deciding for him what's best and not giving him any chance to decide what he could do if he knew about a child. Right. To be fair to her, though, they did have a conversation about them having a child together and it did not go well. So (laughs) she probably assumes that he would just send her up the river and not speak to her for a while, which (laughs) fair probably what would happen. Yes. But I think it's still not fair to take somebody's word at something that is a maybe or not real and then use that against them when that thing actually happens because they could have changed or having the situation be real with especially with something as real as having a child i think that would change circumstances he goes on to say i kill people for my king i'm an assassin molly i don't believe you she whispered she spoke too quickly The horror in her voice was as great as the contempt. A part of her knew that I had spoken the truth to her, finally. A terrible silence, brief but so cold, grew between us as she waited for me to admit a lie. A lie she knew was truth. At last, she denied it for me. And this is what I was talking about. Her looking for excuses to make it easier, Mm -hmm. to be angry to sever that and just convince herself that this was necessary and that he was not the right person that she should love right because she basically says oh you're you're just lying to me even though fitz can tell that she knows it's the truth she lies to herself that oh you're you're lying to me about this you're not a killer you can never be you're just a coward It starts with, you could not be a killer, and then you couldn't even defy your king, and then goes to, you want me to believe that you're a killer? So now it's not even that, like, maybe you're not. It's like, I'm supposed to believe that? Because I think she does know that could be true. Yeah. And he... He says something here in response to it, to her her final comment. Why now, of all times, to impress me? He says, if I had thought it would impress you, I probably would have told you a long time ago, I confessed. And it was true. My ability to keep secrets had been soundly based on my fear that telling Molly would mean losing her. I was right. Which, okay, Fitz. Yeah. That is... It's not the reason. No, there is obviously more... This is you, another instance of Fitz not listening... She's saying, you can't ever put me first. And he's like, clearly it's because I told her I kill people. Like, no fits. <laughs> that doesn't matter at this point. Like, yeah, she's probably a little shocked, but it's not. I right. don't know. It's he just gets so mopey about it and it frustrates me so much. <laughs> it's typical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lies, she said to herself more than me. Lies, all lies from the very beginning. I was so stupid. If a man hits you once, he'll hit you again, they say, and the same is true for lying. But I stayed, and I listened, and I believed. What a fool I've been. Thank you, Fitz Chivalry, she said coldly, formally. You've made this so much easier for me. She turned away from me. Molly, I begged. I reached to take her arm, but she spun about, her hand raised to slap me. Don't touch me, she warned in a low voice. Don't you ever dare to touch me again. She left. Fitz goes into a more more of a mopey little mindset here. Mm -hmm. And I have something highlighted in my notes. He says, I had always feared that my lies would make me lose Molly, but the truth had severed in an instant what my lies had held together for a year. What must I learn from that, I wondered. Nothing, Fitz. Don't learn anything from that. Yeah. Also, excuse me, what? She already severed the tie before you told her. Right. It was severed. You were done. She is done with you. You telling her the truth now, after years, doesn't make it better. It doesn't fix the problem. You have to start from the beginning telling truths. You can't wait until everything is falling apart to be like, okay, now maybe... I can right. say I can say one truth. <laughs> uh, 
fits. And this is exactly what Molly is talking about. He leaves everything from her. The fact that she doesn't even know about his day-to-day life, he really was putting her in a box. He didn't tell her about patients or the things he did that weren't killing people because he wasn't killing people all the time. So the excuse of, well, I was an assassin, is stupid. You also worked in the stables with Burek. Did you talk about that at all? Probably not. It's just so sad that Fitz is so hell-bent on making sure that all of his self-pitying worries come true, that he doesn't even stop for a second and look around and realize, it's not the lies that were the problem, it was me. I did something bad here. But instead, it's almost a shifting of blame. Which, this is a hard breakup, so I get it. He's a child. Again, breakups like, are hard yeah like like we've mentioned throughout all of this relationship both sides are not guilt-free but fits of course we see in his mind and he's just his mopey self and right can't really even process what has happened here uh, i mean honestly that's that makes sense that yeah. he can't immediately process it but he never really gets through it no no he doesn't And I feel bad for him. And I know it's more frustrating because we do see exactly what's going on in his mind. So it's like being able to see exactly the point of logic that he's not quite getting. Whereas with Molly, we just have to guess. We only have what Fitz feels from her and what she says. But yeah, it's rough. I do feel bad for both of them. This is a hard situation. After standing for a time on the stairs, Fitz goes up and knocks on Burek's door, being let in, and asks, what was Molly doing here? And Burek replies, she came for herbs. He said uneasily, I could not help her, I did not have what she wanted. Then the fool came and she stayed to help me with him. Patience and Lacey have herbs. Lots of them, I pointed out. That is what I told her. He turned away from me. He began clearing away the things he had used to work on the fool. She did not wish to go to them. There was something in his voice, almost prodding, pushing me to the next question. That's not the question that he's uh, quite pushing you to, Fitz, but... Yeah. Fitz immediately interprets it like, oh, you know, he's asking what's happening, and she says, or excuse me, Fitz says, she's going away. But Burek, I'm pretty sure, has a good idea that she's pregnant. Right. We don't know what kind of herbs she's looking for. I'd like to imagine the raspberry, raspberry tea. tea. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's specifically why she didn't go to Patience and Lacey, because mm-hmm. she doesn't want them to know. And Burek can figure that out, because he's a smart guy. Right. <laughs> in some situations. And so he's trying to get Fitz to be like, well, what kind of herbs wouldn't Patience and Lacey want to know about? And instead... He's like, she's leaving me. And then Burek's like, wait, what? <laughs> it's it's kind of humorous, all the hints that are here whenever you know. Mm-hmm. But, oh, poor Fitz. The fool asks him, did you succeed? And Fitz has to stop for a little bit and think. He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I did. I had succeeded at losing Molly, too. Ugh. Succeeded at wearing away her loyalty and her love, taking her for granted. Succeeded at being so logical and practical and loyal to my king that I had lost any chance of ever having a life of my own. I looked at Birik. Did you love patience, I asked suddenly, when you decided to leave? Self-pitying fool. Mm Mm-hmm. He just... It's sad because... I almost feel like he wanted this to happen in a way. I mean, not in a good way. I think it's an unhealthy, self-sabotaging way. But everyone he loves leaves him, and that's yeah. his belief. And so that's it fair. feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy where he makes the people who love him leave because... He can never then, trust them. And- yeah, and then he's like, see, there's a reason I couldn't trust you. And it's that's not it at all. Not everybody leaves, but you have to give them a chance and you have to open up your life to them. It's like the skill. It's as easy as not being closed. And I don't think he quite grasps that. 
and it might be partially his age. Also, this is young love that grew toxic, and that's hard. And a lot of trauma based on opening himself up as well. Every yeah. time he has, going along with the skill analogy, being open is not closed. Yeah, that works emotionally as well, but every time he's opened himself up, either with the skill, with the wit, or emotionally, he does get hurt. Mm-hmm. Someone dies, someone leaves. He feels he's abandoned. Mm-hmm. It's a rough childhood to go through. He's only 17. Yes. The fool started and then visibly goggled. So there were some secrets even he did not know. So the fool did not know about patience and Birik. Mm-hmm. It was a close-kept secret, I guess. <laughs> and Birik <laughs> is a little frustrated. Face went as dark as I had ever seen it. He crossed his arms on his chest as if to restrain himself. He might kill me, I thought. Or maybe he sought only to hold some pain inside himself. He glared at me, then spoke carefully. I am not a changeable man, he told me. If I had loved her, I would love her still. So, it would never go away. But still, you decided. Someone had to decide. Patience would not see it, that it could not be. Someone had to end the torment for us both, as Molly had decided for us. I tried to think just what I should do next. Nothing came to me. Do you think this is Burek's way of taking Molly's side? Maybe a little bit. I don't think... Birk thinks there's a side to take. He wants to right. comfort Fitz as much as possible, but he also, as he has stated to Fitz before, said he thought that patience was correct in telling you to stay away from Molly. Mm-hmm. So I think he's, you know, he's hurt. He's, he's hurting inside for Fitz, but also he knows it was probably for the best. But at the same time, he also knows that Molly is pregnant, so... Right, and which it, this is probably or at a time least period. He suspects probably. Yeah, and this is a time period where it's probably not great to be a single mom. Well, it's a land historically not great to be <laughs> a single person growing up in general. <laughs> right. They they say all the time that you know people need to get married out of necessity because it's easier to have multiple people helping out to mm-hmm. survive. Mm-hmm. So any single person, let alone a single mother, is. In danger. Yeah, definitely. And Birk is all about protecting people. So to distract himself from the Molly misery, he asks Fool how his shoulder is. To which Fool replies, wrenched but not broken, much better than your heart. A quick bantering of witty words. I had not known he could wait a jest with so much sympathy. And so now he begins to rock back and forth in his chair and wonder, what will I do? What do I do from here? And it's, this is hard. I don't know how to deal with this feeling. So in Burek fashion, he brings down some whiskey and says, don't feel the feelings, drink them. Which, oh, is so bad. And Fool does make a mention that he asks, are you sure this is wise? And Fitz replies, just now I'm done with being wise. I told him I would rather be a fool. You do not know of what you speak, he told me. All the same, he raised his glass alongside mine to fools of all kinds. They toast to Molly, to fools of all kinds, and a third time to our king. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And right after their third toast... Who else but Patience? Or, no. Lacey. Lacey walks in, which might as well be Patience because she's going to be hearing about it. Yeah, Fitz says, we made a sincere effort. And a sincere effort to, you know, drink away their pain and get drunk. But fate did not allow us sufficient time. Mm -hmm. Which also, okay, just time out for one second. Putting aside the fact that it is super unhealthy to run away from your feelings, especially if you're going to substances to get away from those feelings. They're literally in the middle of a plot 
to get the king some help right now. Things are very dangerous. And they're like, well, might as well get drunk. <laughs> it's just so insane. I guess Burek doesn't necessarily know what's going on. But the fool knows. Fitz knows. Ugh. Frustrating. To fools of all kinds. I suppose. Lacey comes in, shutting the door fast behind her. Get rid of this for me, will you? She asked, and tumbled the slain chicken out on the table before us. We didn't mention it earlier, but she used the slain chicken for blood to draw Wallace out to yes. Ketrickin's room. Dinner, announced the fool enthusiastically. It took Lacey a moment to realize the state we were in. It took her less than that to be furious. <laughs> While we gamble our lives and reputations, you get drunk? She rounded on Burek. In 20 years, you have not learned that it solves nothing. Burek flinched, not at all. Some things cannot be solved, he pointed out philosophically. Drink makes those things much more tolerable. He came to his feet easily, stood rock steady before her. Years of drinking seemed to have taught him the knack of handling it well. What did you need? <laughs> I thought this following little bit was kind of funny. Uh, Lacey bites her lip for a moment and just continues along just to drop the, the drinking thing and says, I need that disposed of and I need an ointment for bruises. The fool chimes in. Does no one around here ever use the healer? <laughs> Lacey ignored him. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. We don't hear of the healer being used for anybody of our like main characters. <laughs> right. Well... He's not very competent, and all of our main characters have some base knowledge of rudimentary gardening <laughs> right. or herb knowledge. Like, <laughs> of course they're not going to him. <laughs> right. You know it's bad when the healer knows less than you do, so. Lacey relates the news that men are chopping down King Shrewd's door. And Fitz just nods and like, yep, that's that's what's going to happen. He says, I wasn't going to attempt Burek's graceful stance. <laughs> the fool leaped to his feet instead, crying, what? He rounded on me. I thought you said you had succeeded. What success is this? And so he, he explains, like, just have some trust in me. Give it at least, you know, a night, a day's trust. Mm -hmm. I did the best I could on a short notice. It's getting handled or it should be handled. It's out of my hands now. Right. Like, we did the best that we could. Hoping that Shade has done something to help the situation. Right. Well, at least he knows that Shade for sure was there. So that's good. Yep. And Fitz asks about how everyone else is doing. And Lacey responds that they're doing well enough. The queen is sore and bruised from her fall. And for myself, I am not all that sure that the babe is out of danger of being lost. A miscarriage from a fall does not always happen immediately. But let us not borrow trouble. Wallace was concerned but ineffectual. For a man who claims to be a healer, he knows remarkably little of the true lore of herbs. As for the prince, Lacey snorted but said no more. And I wanted to point that out because she's right. Either it's the hard journey or it's delayed from the fall. Ketchkin mm -hmm. does lose her child. Yeah. And while the masquerade works, it's not entirely untrue. Yeah. Or at least it's a cruel foreshadowing. Right. It is really horrible that this happens, but... Ugh. I don't know. Yeah. And so they're asking questions now of, like, what, what happens next? The fool asks if it's a bad idea to let this rumor circulate at all. Yeah. Doesn't that put Ketrickin in danger? Or in even more danger, I guess. Yeah, it does. And Fitz basically says it's a short notice. I did the best I could. And in a couple of days, she'll say that the baby's fine and it'll go back to normal. Just a little naive, but at the same time, it is a very short notice, and he just kind of right. concocted something on the fly in like an hour. <laughs> yeah, he did his best, and he's right that they, that's kind of what they have to go off of. Yeah. It kind of doesn't matter. She's probably going to have her life attempted either way, so if she's running soon, it doesn't matter if people think that she miscarried or not. 
Yeah. So with them asking what happens next, Fitz says, we disperse, go back to our normal lives. We, you know, we're just Mm -hmm. being normal here. And she points out that enough has been said and done in this room to put us all a swing in from a tree for treason. Save you, of course, Fitz Chivalry. It would have to be poison for you. Those of the royal blood are not allowed to swing. Her words had a chilling effect. Beric picked up the cork and restoppered the bottle. Lacey left first. The fool followed her a short time later. When I left Beric, he had finished cleaning the fowl and was plucking the last stubborn feathers from it. And Fitz goes and wanders a little bit. He's wondering about, you know, certain things. Ketchikan would be resting, and Fitz doesn't think that he could go to visit patients right now. He couldn't stand her nattering about the plan or whatever's mm-hmm. going on, or her insights. And if the fool was in his chamber, it was because he did not want company, so he wasn't going to go seek out the fool. Mm-hmm. And so he thinks about Night Eyes and heads to the hut where he had previously had Night Eyes. Right. Which kind of reminded me that although Fitz is stuck to within the keep walls, there is like a giant field here where they had yeah. grazing for sheep and other livestock. Mm-hmm. So... I think I forget sometimes that that doesn't mean literally like within the, the walls inner, of the building. Yeah, yeah. I forget that there's probably a lot of land that he can actually roam around. Yeah. Just can't go down to town or anything right. like that. Yeah. So just a good reminder for any of those like me who forget that <laughs> the walls are probably not super tight around. Right. <laughs> he sits in the hut and waits for night eyes and he doesn't have to wait too long. Perhaps the greatest comfort of the wit bond is never having to explain. I did not need to recount the last day's events to him, did not have to find words to describe how it felt to watch Molly walk away from me, nor did he ask questions or make sympathetic talk. The human events would have made small sense to him. He acted on the strength of what I felt, not why. He simply came to me and sat beside me on the dirty floor. I could put an arm around him and lean my face against his ruff and sit. Which would be extremely comforting. Oh, yeah. Just having somebody know that you, you, they need you there mm-hmm. and just being there and not having to explain, like, what happened, what's going on. Just right. being the person that you need at that moment. Yeah, it does make the wit a very special bond. It would be really nice to have somebody who could share your feelings in a way that they know. And then they could way easier decipher how to handle the next going forward because they would know based off exactly what you're feeling, how you would want them to act. So Night Eyes and him have a small conversation after a little bit. And Night Eyes asks, what will you do for a mate now? Fitz basically says, not all wolves have mates. And I says, the pack leader always does. And Fitz replies, well, good thing I'm not the pack leader, and the pack leader's mate is pregnant right now. Mm -hmm. Ketrikin, meaning Ketrikin. Perhaps wolves have it aright, and men should pay attention. Perhaps only the leader should mate. That was the decision that heart of the pack made long ago. That he could not have both a mate and a leader he followed with all of his heart. That one is more wolf than he cares to admit. To anyone. A pause. Gingerbread? (laughs) And Fitz had earlier grabbed some gingerbread from the kitchen, so he gave it to him. (laughs) Yes. And, you know, his little mopey, like, perhaps it's better not to ever date ever again, is so dramatic. so teenager. It's very teenager. Very, I I just broke up with somebody. That's how I picture you when you were younger, Emma. (laughs) That's rude, but true. (laughs) (laughs) Definitely me during breakups in high school. I'll never love anyone else ever again. (laughs) It's Taylor Swift blasting in the background. Definitely. (laughs) So at the end of Fitz and Night Eye's conversation, they're walking away and Fitz mentions, it's my weakness to want too much. He blinked his deep eyes. You love too many. My life is much simpler. He loved only me. That is true. 
The only real difficulty I have is knowing that you will never trust that it is so. I sighed heavily. Even Night Eyes is like, yeah. boy, you got some trust issues. <laughs> it's, you know, it's wild, especially because they have this deep connection of emotion. There is a bond there. And even with that level of knowing Night Eyes' heart, he's still like, well, does he really like me, though? Yeah. <laughs> And I want to point out that Night Eyes knows that that Fitz wanted to share Molly's life instead of Night Eyes. Mm -hmm. And that's what Fitz's weakness is, he says. Life is better shared. A pause. You would have rather shared the female's life. It is my weakness to want too much. Yes. And, And that line there... Even knowing that Fitz probably would have chosen Molly and hid Night Eyes still for the rest of his life, mm-hmm. Night Eyes would have went along with it. Yeah. He's and such Fitz a good is, boy. He's he such, such a good pup. such a good pup. <laughs> and yet Fitz is like, well, does he like me though? I don't know. Maybe he just puts up with me for the ginger cakes. Like, come on, Fitz. <laughs> At Night least Eyes. trust your dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Night Eyes sneezes and says, I mislike this mouse dust, but before I go, use your so clever hands to scratch inside my ears. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets a good scritch. He gets pet really good. And then uh, bit because Fitz calls him a hound. <laughs> yes. Well, Fitz gets bit. Yeah. <laughs> the, the petting goes to Night Eyes. I, yeah, I kind of figured that people would understand that. <laughs> That Fitz wasn't the one biting Night Eyes. <laughs> well, I would hope so. He says, for that insult, you pay, after Fitz calls him a hound affectionately. And uh, dents Fitz's arms, but doesn't quite make him bleed. <laughs> Wolf humor. So he walks away, probably feeling a little bit better, even if he doesn't want to admit it to himself. It's, oh, yeah. He's missed Night Eyes. I'm sure it's nice to get to see his dog. It's the first time in a long time that they've spent time together. Mm-hmm. At least over the past couple weeks. Yeah. So as he's walking away from Night Eyes, he stops by the kitchen on his way up to his room to get some of the gossip, see if anything has worked, what's going on. And he finds out that people are already talking about what may or may not ha- happen to the queen's baby and that the men had chopped through the outer door of the king's room after his guard had suddenly perished of apoplexy. And the second door, too. All the time, Prince Regal worrying and urging them on for fear something had befallen the king himself. But when they got through, despite all that chopping, the king was asleep like a babe, sir. And so deep asleep, they could not rouse him at all to tell him why they'd chopped his doors away. Yeah, and Fitz and her gossip about other things as well after that incident with the king asleep. Yes. Sleeping through everything. Which is kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> or what shade gave it to him. I know. Probably a very wild concocture. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Fitz learns through Cook Sarah that the Queen's Guard and the few guards who still wore the colors of King Shrewd's personal guard were both going to stay at Buckkeep to, quote, maintain a, you know, a royal presence mm-hmm. in Buckkeep. But that's uh, separating out Any the queen might be loyal. Yeah, the mm-hmm. queen's guard and the king's guard from the king and queen. Yep. And uh, it does mention that since... King Shrewd's guards had lost the privilege of his rooms. They had become a dispirited lot. Yeah. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. (laughs) They have nothing to do, and they see... Yeah, only Regal's men are allowed to guard the king now. Which you think would make them talk about why that is, and don't you think it's a little weird that Regal is separating the people designated to protect these people? Like, sure, some of them have to stay, but do all of them? You can't let the queen have two bodyguards on her. Nobody thinks that's weird. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, okay. 
also I want to point out a little little wordplay in here that I think is kind of fun. Fitz is learning who is going to Tradeford and who is staying. And he says here, Rosemary would go and her mother, but that was hardly surprising. See us as who they served. Fitz is, of course, thinking Ketrickin, but in my uh-huh. head, I'm just like, oh, yeah, it is it isn't surprising that they, they would go to Tradeford because they serve Regal. Right. No, it is funny. I guess I'm just sitting here talking about how, how could they not put the logic together? And then Fitz is here like, yeah, of course Rosemary gets to go. Nobody else that works for Ketrickin gets to go. But Rosemary, yeah, obviously, because she works for the queen. <laughs> yeah, little uh, little missed hints. Fitz is deep into his despair and is picturing the high table without anybody there and how empty it would be. He's thinking on how scarce the food is going to become because all the stores are gone and they're going to be eating wild fowl and seaweed. And by spring. By yeah. spring. And he's more worried for Patience and Lacey because he doesn't mind hard food because he had some like on the ships and things mm-hmm. like that. But they're used to different Different kinds of food, which I think they would be completely fine. Oh, yeah. I'm sure (laughs) Patience likes to eat seaweed for fun. Like, she'll be fine. (laughs) Mello was still going to be there, the old bard. So Mm -hmm. Fitz is like, oh, maybe they'll provide, you know, some entertainment (laughs) if he doesn't get too depressed with his abandonment. Right. Fedrin's going to be there. So there's few children to teach, but perhaps he and Patience could finally study out their paper making. So he's trying to find these... Silver linings. Silver linings to what is going to happen in the future, even though he still is trying to plan for that to be avoided. Right. He's just like, oh, maybe it can. It could be fine. Yeah, maybe it won't be so bad. Serene is suddenly stepping out of a doorway right in front of his room. Mm-hmm. He's kind of wandering through the castle, the keep, going back to his room, and all of a sudden, she pops out and fits isn't surprised because he knew with the wit that somebody was there Mm -hmm. but immediately is just like what do you want (laughs) get out of my room yeah and she says you smell like a dog you smell like a dog because you are more than half a dog yourself beast magicker he is back and forth like subtly insulting her during this Mm -hmm. brief conversation but holds himself back and as he was about to insult her mother, thinks of something from their past together and instead responds with, when we were first learning to scribe, remember how your mother always made you wear a dark smock for you splattered your ink so? She stared at me sullenly, turning the remark every which way in her mind, trying to discover some insult or slight or trick in it. What of it? She asked at last, unable to leave it hanging. Nothing. Nothing. I but remembered it. It was a time when I helped you getting the tales right on your letters. That has nothing to do with now, she declared angrily. No, it does not. This is my door. Were you expecting to come in with me? She spat, not quite at me, but it landed on the floor at my feet. For some reason, I decided she would not have done it had she not been leaving Buckkeep with Regal. It was no longer her home, and she felt free to soil it before leaving it. It told me much. She never expected to come back here. And I thought that that little page there was a good way to humanize Serene again. Yeah. Especially reading it through the first time, we're all told that she became this hateful person. She wanted to exceed expectations for Mm -hmm. Galen. She wanted to please him, even though he was never going to be pleased. Mm -hmm. And then she kind of became him after his death, becoming gaunt as austere as he was living in his chambers. Right. Essentially trying to become Galen. And all of a sudden we get a humanizing memory, a moment that makes her a person again. Right. And this is done right before she's killed by Fitz. Yeah. It's a it's very interesting, I don't know, interesting way of writing something because I remember reading this the first time or even on rereads, you forget this small scene because it takes place over the, a half a page. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, remember your mother used to wear, make you wear a dark shirt because you got stains on it? What does that mean? I don't know. 
but like we were kids once and I helped you with your letters. Like, yeah, we used to be on good terms. Yeah. I thought it was a very interesting glimpse into the past because we don't get stories like that usually. Yeah. I don't know. I think it also shows that Fitz is trying to remind her, you know, at one point we were just normal kids and got along. Now we don't. And it's really sad, but you're not coming into my room with me, <laughs> yeah. you know, and I don't know. I, I think the reason to humanize Serene is kind of to remind everybody that sometimes good people can be misled and they can, you know, yeah. some, even the villains were once children who mm -hmm. needed help with things. It's, you aren't born that way. Right. It's just a product of the path is, paths you choose. And sometimes chosen for you. Right. He checks his room and is just waiting for Che to summon him. He falls asleep lightly and wakes up to a knock at the door, which was Rosemary saying that the queen wishes to see you. So he gets up and he goes to Queen Ketrickin's room, passing Shrewd's doorway, where a Inlander is standing in the gap where the door was. Mm -hmm. So someone that Fitz doesn't know, someone from an inland duchy guarding the room. Yep. Even more show that it's just completely Regal's, Regal's kingdom at the yeah. moment. And Regal has the king under lock and key. Queen Ketchikrin is kind of surrounded by her ladies still, but she still uh, manages to get a, a, a private audience with Fitz for a brief moment, sending Lady Hopeful off for tea for both Fitz and then herself, and in between those asks about what's happening. What's going to happen next? Shrewd sleeps now. He cannot sleep forever. Whatever was given him will wear off, and when it does, we are back to where we were. And Fitz tries to say, the king-in-waiting ceremony is coming up, and Regal will be fully busy with that. There's no way he's going to skip all the opulence that it takes to have a great party throne. So that's another chance at something there. Mm -hmm. And Fitz is like, I don't really know what's after that. And Ketrickin responds that she does. She has a plan. The king would be safe in my mountains. He would be honored and protected, and perhaps Jean Cui would know of... Oh, thank you, Hopeful. Queen Ketrickin took the proffered cup and sipped it as Lady Hopeful settled herself. So, they have to talk in code now. We have a third party listening in. And Fitz chooses his words carefully here, and basically gets by that it's going to be an extremely hard journey to the mountains. Right. And... I don't know if the king can make it, but maybe Burns or Ripon somewhere nearby or closer and not so far north mm -hmm. would have the same, you know, code word for remedy or whatever. But maybe they could offer assistance because they can't really refuse you because they love you, Ketrickin. Right. To and... which Ketrickin brings up, I know they love me, but I cannot ask that of them. Because they're in the middle of fighting for their lives, and it feels like a bit of a burden <laughs> yeah. to ask to take care of an old sick man and also a pregnant woman. And the root we call live long grows only in the mountains. A determined courier could travel there, I think. So she really sees the best chance to live a long life is in the mountains. And Fitz comes back, oh yeah, they're, you know, sending a sick old man off on a journey like that obviously is a bad idea he could not go alone that way can't Ketra can see this so he so he says the man that went would have to be very trustworthy and strong of will such a man sounds like a woman to me Ketra can quipped and hopeful laughed merrily more to see the queen's mood lightened than at the witticism Ketra can paused with her cup at her lips Perhaps I should have to go myself to see the thing done right, she added, and smiled when my eyes widened. But the look she gave me was serious. Fitz excuses himself after some more talk. Mm -hmm. And he really needs to talk to Shade. Right. He doesn't want her acting on this notion before he can get to Shade, Shade to stop her. <laughs> right. Exactly. 
Jade summons him, summons him pretty quickly after he gets back to his room, mm-hmm. almost immediately, and they have a meal upstairs, ready and waiting, and Jade says, sit down and eat. We must plot together. They kind of go over the brief plan. Fitz doesn't bring up Ketrickin right away, but Jade does ask him, how long do you think that these tunnels and these chambers could remain undiscovered if we had to stash the king here for a while? Mm-hmm. And Fitz goes through the progression, like, if they think that the king left by normal means, it would take a long time for them to turn to, did he go missing in his room? Mm-hmm. But if Regal still thought that he was in Buckkeep, he would probably immediately start tearing down the walls of the king's room and find the tunnels immediately. Right. Which also, if they could, like, brick up a couple of the tunnels where they think he would start, that would be so good for just making Regal seem incompetent and destroying his image. Although I don't think they have enough time or noise control to do that. They wouldn't, because they'd have to smuggle the king out, then brick it up. True. And then all the mortar would be wet still. Like, just, and it wouldn't be weathered and old. Fair. I just but feel also, like it, yeah, it would be awesome if they could do that, but that's definitely not happening. Here I am, Mr. Jade herself. <laughs> <laughs> and so Fitz is inquiring, like, have you found a safe place for him? Burns or Ripon or something like that? And Jade's like, of course I haven't. That's impressively fast if I was able to do that. Like, it's impossible. It's been two days, yeah. maybe. <laughs> I have to stash the king here for a while. It, it's going to take a while to get those responses and get safe passage out. So we need a place to have the king wait because we can't have him around Regal this whole time. And also, I need to find a way out of the castle without being seen, or I would need to bribe a bunch of people, which takes time. And and leaves loose ends. Yep. And Fitz is like, oh, I don't worry about that. He's thinking of that way that Night Eyes gets in and out of the castle walls. Right. Which they do end up using. Mm-hmm. That is the way that they go. And Fitz then brings up the other issue. So, mm-hmm. so he's like, okay, well, the king has to be stashed. That's fine. I'll trust in it. We still want it, the king to go to Burns or Ripon. And then he brings up. Queen Ketrickin's thing, like, we have another problem. Ketrickin wants to send him off to the mountains and go herself. Mm-hmm. And, and Jade says, a pregnant woman and a sick old man in midwinter? Ridiculous. Jade paused. But it would never be expected. They would never look for them on that road. And with all the flow of folk that Regal has created going up the Buck River, one more woman and her ailing father would scarcely be marked. It's still ridiculous, I protested. I did not like the sparks of interest I had seen kindle in Chade's eyes. Who would go with them? Beric. It would save him from drinking himself to death from boredom, and he could manage their animals for them, and likely much else they would need. Would he go? You know he would, I said unwillingly, but Shrewd would never survive such a trip. He is more likely to survive such a trip than to survive going with Regal. That which eats at him will continue to devour his life wherever he is. He frowned more darkly. But why it eats at him so much more swiftly these days is beyond me to say. And I will pause there because we know what's Mm -hmm. making that disease eat at him more swiftly. It's because he's being skill-drained and his strength is going away from him. Yeah. But it does bring up the point that since this sickness start, he has not always been being, being drained. Right. It was progressing naturally for a while, but lately mm-hmm. he's been being drained. So he hasn't been um, having skill siphoned off of him for the whole time that he's been bedridden or in pain. He could have still had skill being siphoned off of him, but probably not as much. We know that Yeah, that's fair. he wasn't bedridden until after the death of Galen. So Yeah. And Galen yeah. was taking from the king. Yeah, it's definitely fair. That could, That could be true. But he was also kind of getting sick around that time. I don't know. He's older, and sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. And there's a potential that it's just like a regular sickness that could be cured if it wasn't for the fact. And he did have that head injury, Mm -hmm. as noted before. Scars on his temples and stuff like that. So there's definitely things that could be bringing on a sickness. But we also know that the skill draining 
enhanced that. And yes, it is amplifying it for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure be- mostly because all of your willpower would be to save your brain and then you can't fight against disease at the same time as you're trying to protect your brain. So it'd be pretty hard. Mm-hmm. And so Chad is pretty set on this plan. Honestly, he kind of gets to it and he's thinking about dressing them up in disguises and there's ins along the way. So it won't be as hard as you think. And then he tells Fitz, tomorrow night, we must do something by tomorrow night, for that is when the sleeping potion I gave Shrewd will wear off. And Fitz is like, tomorrow night? (laughs) There is no way. Way too soon. Right. Because Chade wants two lowly horses and a donkey, Mm -hmm. which take time to get and even more time to figure out how to smuggle out of the barn without anybody noticing. He has to tell Birk about Chade mm-hmm. and the plan. And he has the to queen. tell the queen about the plan and Chade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there's then there's the matter of the fool as well. So <laughs> yeah, there's a ton to do. And Chade's like, no, tomorrow night because we don't know when Regal's assassin is gonna make another attempt. And Fitz is like, Regal's assassin? And Chade says the obvious thing of like, well, Regal wouldn't do this himself. Yeah. He's not gonna smother a step in oil. <laughs> Like that? Why would he do that himself? Who do you think is the assassin? And Fitz replies, Serene. Immediately, without hesitation. And Chade's like, then it most obviously is not her. But we'll find it to be some mouse of a man with a pleasant demeanor and a settled life. If we ever find out at all. If we ever find him out at all. Yeah. He's convinced this is a grown man. Oh yeah, because that's all he's known all of his life. Right. And it's that bias that Let's Rosemary sneak past. Mm-hmm. But also, he just trained a child. Did he not look into Rosemary's background? Do we clearly? Well, I think he was... did. But like, she was truly a refugee from the war. But Ketrickin took her in, right? So her background probably checked out. But then Regal started training her. It's not like Regal right. trained before and then introduced her. You're right. That's so weird. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess not obvious at all. Unless you know what you're looking for. Yeah. (sighs) After some thought, Fitz does say Will and describes him to Chade. And Chade thinks that would actually be brilliant to have a skilled assassin. It's a wonder no one had thought of it before. Perhaps Shrewd did, I said quietly. But perhaps his assassin failed to learn. Chade leaned back in his chair. I wonder, he said speculatively. Shrewd is close-mouthed enough to have such an idea, and keep it even from me. But I doubt myself that Will is any more than a spy just now. A formidable one, and no mistaking that. You must be especially vigilant, but I do not think we need fear him as an assassin. Which is true and not true. Yes. All at once. He is not the assassin for the king. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think Shrewd planned to have him trained as an assassin. I think Galen did it. Right. And he tried to make all of them an assassin, and Will was probably the most apt. Oh, you're talking learn. about something completely different than what I thought. Oh yeah? What what were you thinking? I thought you were talking I thought you were talking about Fitz for a second. Or no. I knew you were talking about Phil, but then Phil? <laughs> I don't know what I thought you were saying, but somewhere I thought you switched from talking about Will to Fitz, because I don't think Shrewd meant to train Fitz in the skill. Oh, yeah, no. uh, As a skilled assassin. No, yeah. But I don't think Galen trained any of them to be assassins either. He is an assassin because Will is the one ultimately being the most greedy and sucking up all of the king's skill. You don't think that... No, Will's not sucking up the skill. Who is? It's uh, the two that Fitz kill. Serene well, they and Justin. Are... I thought... Is Justin the one that's quiet then? Mm-mm, Will's the one that's quiet. I thought he was also doing it, but he was taking more. He takes the other Coterie members later on, I believe. Mm. Okay, well, that busts my theory apart. <laughs> but I, you don't think that Galen taught them how to kill and be like assassin like in the training I he mean, was making them his army his tool to get glory i think he taught them how to take skill from people and that 
can kill people. But I don't think he was like, and here's the poison you need to put in someone's tea. No, I'm not talking about actual assassin skills that Fitz learned. I'm talking about literal things that the skill can do to kill people. Mm, Okay, well, in that sense, yeah, he probably did train them. Although, why wouldn't they have used it on Fitz already? Or somebody else? Why hasn't other people died? I guess that would make them, like, psychopath murderers, but, like... (laughs) (laughs) They probably didn't get orders from Regal to do so. I suppose. Kings, men, and women. Mm. Yep. And so, Jade's all set on that idea, but wants it to happen tomorrow night. But Fitz is like, I, it can't be, that's way too soon. There's just no time to set this up. And Jade's like, anything that must be done can be done. He sat thoughtfully for a moment. Perhaps you have a point. Regal cannot have the king incapacitated for the ceremony. If he is not there, not one of the coastal dukes will give it any credence. Regal will have to allow Shrewd his pain herbs to keep him tractable, if nothing else. Very well, then. The night after tomorrow. And if you absolutely must speak to me tomorrow, put some, you know, he says, put some herb on the fire. I'll I'll smell it. Mm -hmm. And then Fitz brings up the fool. He will want to go with the king, I reminded myself slowly. He cannot, Shade said decisively. There is no disguising him. He would only increase the danger. Besides, it is necessary he stay. We will need his help to prepare for this disappearance. I underlined the there's no disguising him because we know (laughs) that the fool is like basically the Sherlock Holmes of disguises. Yep. (laughs) So it is funny that he's like, obviously. (laughs) He does rely on his changed skin tone later. True. When he is more like a closer to a human. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right now, he's very pale. Yes, like, extremely. Right. But he still passes as a woman. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like he, And he teaches women how to passibly walk and act like a man without yeah. being over-exaggerated. Yeah, I'm so, not yeah. saying that he's not a good disguised person, but right but, now, it would be hard to disguise him with his... Hair and... Yes. See, there's makeup and dirt and... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> And so Chade says, like, I'll deal with the fool, but, you know, we, we have to do this soon. So two days from now, tomorrow, the night after tomorrow, and that is during the king and waiting ceremony. Right. And Chade is saying, I'm going to create an atmosphere so crazy that a king and queen disappearing in thin air won't even seem out of place. And he says he will discourage them from smashing the walls to find the rooms here. Queen's role is easy, so we just want Katrikin to retire from the ceremony early, saying she wants to rest more, and that's pretty much all of the planning that they can do right now. Mm-hmm. He says, it's better this way, we are more flexible. Now go get what sleep you can, boy, you have a busy day tomorrow, and I have much to do right now. I must mix enough medicines to take King Shrewd all the way to the mountains, and package them clearly. Birks reads, does he not? And then he brings up the uh, <laughs> the little rumor that Fitz heard before. Mm-hmm. Were you at the keep well last night, about midnight? Supposedly the pocked man was seen. Some are saying it means the well will go bad. Others are seeing it as a bad omen for Regal's ceremony. Oh? Well, and perhaps it is, Chade chuckled to himself. Omens and portents they shall have, boy, until a vanishing king and a missing queen seem but a natural thing in the midst of it. He grinned like a boy, and the years dropped from his face. Something like their old spark of mischief came into his green eyes. Go and get some rest, and let Beric and the queen know of our plans. I shall speak to Shrewd and the fool. No others are to know, even a whisper. For some of it, we must trust to luck, but for the rest, trust to me— his laughter was not a wholly reassuring sound as it followed me down the stairs. I want to mention really quick that Chade wholeheartedly goes in on Ketrickin's plan pretty much immediately because it is better mm-hmm. than trying to contact the Outer Duchies. Yeah, I think they would get along if Ketrickin cared more for secrecy. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. she's so smart and has great ideas, and Chade loves that. But what Chade doesn't love is that she doesn't believe that there should be assassins, number one, and number two, that 
there needs to be secrecy from what the crown is doing to the people. Right. <laughs> and Jane Different ways of ruling. That. Yes. Yeah. So it saddens me that they can't be closer, but I do know that they get along and you can tell. They also that he have that power likes struggle her. in the Tawny Man, but Yeah, true. It's uh that's another thing to get into in, you know, a couple years. <laughs> but this I think this last paragraph made me feel like Chade wasn't the one who started the rumor really? or he wasn't there. I think because he starts saying, oh, yeah, omens and stuff. That'll get him not even thinking about a missing king and queen and waiting. So I can't wait. And all of a sudden he becomes super mischievous and looks 10 years younger. And, you know, is just really excited again. And before that, he was talking about, well, I don't really know what I'm going to do, but we'll somehow make it easy for the king and queen to get away and now he's like oh yeah the omens and that makes me feel like maybe a kid had a nightmare and talked about it and it's just super good timing or maybe the fool spreader rumor maybe the fool spreader rumor that there's a pock man because he hates regal and wants to see him suffer i don't know maybe i'm still pretty sure that this is a chade rumor okay Especially, like, I think that paragraph, the way that it convinced you that it might not be him, it convinced Mm -hmm. me that it was him. Because previously before, he says, I can show him, the fool, that his king's life depends on his getting away from here cleanly. A, quote, atmosphere must be created, in which the king and queen's disappearance is not seen as... Ah, well, leave that part to me. So Mm -hmm. I think he's already been creating it. He knows what he has to do. And then later, like the next page, he says, omens importance they shall have, boy. So that like to me, that confirmed it. So I don't know. It's it's interesting that you read it differently. I guess I read the first part as though like, well, leave that to me. I'll figure it out later. Hmm. I don't know yet, but it has to be the right atmosphere. And that's what we have to build with the fool staying here. And then he was like, oh, you know, it would be a great atmosphere. (laughs) See, I didn't the way that uh, I have single quotes around the word atmosphere. Mm -hmm. It's the way that Chade pointed out and like he's thinking of a specific thing. He's already working on it rather than a certain atmosphere must be created. So I don't know. It's it's really fun how we can read two things differently. Yeah, completely differently. No, I I guess guess I have I guess I have faith in uh, Chade knowing what he's doing at yeah, this point that's fair I, i'm not thinking that he doesn't know what he's doing right think, yeah i didn't mean to imply yeah, that right <laughs> i just feel it felt more fun to me to feel like he's just capitalizing on oh i get to be totally weird i never get to do the fun <laughs> stuff i always have to murder everybody and now i get to just make a whole bunch of bad things happen <laughs> he does love his job in certain aspects yeah <laughs> he'd be a great prankster i feel <laughs> I don't know, but that's the end of the chapter. Yeah. The maniacal laughing in the tower. Two days, and uh, Fitz is going to murder Justin and Serene while simultaneously they kill the king. Yep. And he's going to get blamed for it, sent to jail, tortured, hung, almost. His life is about to change. Yeah, not quite hung. They were going to hang him, and he died in the cell, quote unquote. Right. So, yeah, life is about to change is a little bit of an understatement, I think. (laughs) Thanks so much for tuning in this week. If you have any uh, topics to send our way, please do. We're always available and we'll try to answer you as soon as possible. And again, thank you so much for tuning in, listening to us every week and rating, reviewing our, our podcasts on different platforms. We really appreciate everything that you guys do. Thanks, guys. So, it's my favorite part. (laughs) When we get to talk about what you guys send to us. Yeah, so you don't have to talk to me anymore. (laughs) Talk about the point of our podcast. I know. No, it's just really fun, I think, to see everybody's points of view. And I especially love when people point out things that I didn't even think of or just read it in a way completely different to me and how I would ever interpret things. I think it's so cool. Or expanding on something that we didn't spend a ton of time on or something. Yeah, Yeah, it's it's just really fun to have a community where we all just geek out about this book and the series. (laughs) 
So this week we had someone reach out on Twitter. La Hara Sadai or Lajara Sadai. I am sorry <laughs> if I just butchered it, but um, that is who reached out to us on Twitter and made the comment. So she reached out to let us know that she was thinking when Burek is confronting Fitz, they read it as more of an accusation that Fitz lives too animal in quotes of a lifestyle. And it's further indictment of how he uses the wit and how that's harmful. Yeah. That it's since humans should take more care in their surroundings and, and be, you know, more comfort creatures, mm -hmm. the way that he's using it just as a place to sleep, maybe temporarily seems more like a den. Mm -hmm. And it mirrors Night Eye's attitude of what will be, will be. But... The, she also points out that it could also come from Fitz having no control over his life from birth, basically, and it, that playing a part of it. So I just thought this was a really cool idea that perhaps the anger Burek is feeling is coming from, oh my gosh, I'm letting the wit get to him. <laughs> yeah, he's just not human enough and never has been all of his life, and that's my fault for not beating it out of him. Yeah. This is chivalry's child. This is chivalry's child, for goodness sake. <laughs> he has to live better than this. Yeah. So that was like a really cool point of view that I had not even considered. Yeah. And makes me less mad at Burek. I feel like that's what most people do when they give me their points of view. I'm like, oh, thank goodness I don't have to be mad at these characters anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Which I very much appreciate. Also, I want to point out that she was a big Wheel of Time fan, so I, I approve. <laughs> great, great job. I like the... Like the handle for Twitter there. <laughs> Thanks so much for reaching out. Yeah, we always enjoy hearing what you guys have to say. Stay safe out there, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> <laughs>